This is the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. And now, Bob Cordaro. Great, good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. My name is Bob Cordaro, and this is The Bob Cordaro Show on TV. As many of you know, I do radio five days a week, 9 a.m. to noon on WILK, appointment radio, we call it. And now we do this thing, The Bob Cordaro Show on TV, each and every week on WNEP-TV 16. This show is devoted to the greatness of our area, northeastern and central Pennsylvania. So we accentuate the positive. Is it cheerleading? Darn right it is, and we need more of it. First, we're joined in our regular health segment by Dr. Brian France, who is tops in his field of dentistry and a world-recognized periodontist. He'll talk to us about TMJ. Then our Power Brunch Player of the Week is Bobby Adcroft. I know Bobby forever, but I wasn't around for his incredible struggle with cancer. It's a fight that he saw through until today. His faith, his family, and an indomitable spirit carried the day against this dread disease. I've been amazed by his posts on social media and at work. He's a top salesman at WILK Carezy and Froggy, where I work my day job. Prepare to be inspired. So with the help of God, our families, and each other, let us begin. Dr. Brian France is an internationally recognized periodontist. He heads a multi-specialty dental practice in Dunmore and has consulted, lectured, and taught around the world in his chosen field. Well, our regular health segment uh, is with Dr. Brian France. Always great to have him. And today we're touching on something that's incredibly serious and much more widespread than a lot of you might think. TMJ. Uh, Dr. France, first of all, welcome. Good morning, Bob. Always good to be here. T- I know of TMJ. Sure. I, don't, I know mandibular. Mm-hmm. I, what does it stand for? Well, first of all, I'm finally happy to finally have my own prop here. So I'm <laughs> you've had, you brought teeth no, in I, before. No, this is yes. my first. You have that microphone. No, you had the teeth. Well, I'm not going to argue with <laughs> it. <laughs> so uh, to your point, temporomandibular joint. It's a a very common disorder that we see in dental offices. About 75% uh, of uh, adults, uh, young adults and up, have some form of this disorder. It's very common. Uh, What it is, uh, is the joint itself, okay, the temporomandibular joint is located back here, and it's the junction between the mandible and the temporalis bone in the skull. So it's the temporomandibular joint. Okay, and that's where it's located. And what happens over time, there's various reasons why, the joint, like any other joint, deteriorates and essentially goes to bone on bone. And what we don't see on this uh, prop is the muscles and the ligaments uh, that surround and encapsulate the joint. So once the joint becomes inflamed, the muscles and ligaments become very sore and creates a lot of pain for the patient. Okay. The, some of the common causes for temporomandibular joint are uh, the patient's teeth are malaligned. Uh, they may have had a lot of dental work done through the years, and over time the work is deteriorating and the joint is trying to compensate, right? It's just like wearing an old pair of shoes. Over time, you know, your hip is compensating for the wear and tear in, mm-hmm. in, 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 the, in the shoes. And it's the same thing for the TMJ joint. It's compensating. Uh, There can be some developmental problems with the joint that just doesn't form right. Trauma is another, uh, you know, somebody who's who's sustained an accident of one form or another. Boxers, for example, over time will develop TMJ problems, motor vehicle accidents, tumors, etc. And this wasn't well known 25, 30 years ago, or was it? I I had a, had a, a, a case. It was an accident case. She developed TMJ, and it was had really serious symptoms and manifestations. And the insurance company on the other side didn't understand it. They didn't know how deep the ramifications could be. Yeah, I mean, the, the pain levels can get very, very extensive with this problem. 
Um, and you're right, 20 and 25 years ago, we didn't, we really, I don't want to use the word misdiagnosis, um, but it's easy to misdiagnose a TMJ problem. So for example, patients will come in with neck pain, shoulder pain, ear pain, fluid in the ear, okay, uh, pain in the skin, confusing it with maybe a neuralgia. So um, what we've gotten over the last 20 years is we've, like anything else in medicine, we've refined you know, our diagnostic abilities and in, with TMJ, some of the imaging that is now available for us uh, really helps us to hone in on and really- That's where your high-tech office pays off. Correct. I mean, we, we have CBCT imaging in our office that we use for a variety of things. You know, it's essentially a CAT scan. And we're able to look at the joint three-dimensionally and uh, determine for the patient, you know, okay, this is what type of joint problem you have. Uh, there are many different kinds. There's, uh, you know, within the joint, there's a capsule that lies between the actual mandible and upper jaw. Mm -hmm. And over time, that disc, like a knee, wears out. And that has its own set of diagnostic criteria. So like anything else, uh, the joint, uh, you make the right diagnosis based on imaging, based on clinical presentations, and then you develop a treatment plan for the patient. Give me examples of some of the treatment plans. Sure. So <clears throat> depending on the diagnosis, uh, most of the time, uh, our philosophy and our practice is one of is very conservative. So we'll start off with what I call self-care. We'll have the patient use non-steroidals, you know, like Advil, Motrin, uh, aspirin, that type of thing to help reduce inflammation, soft diet, avoid chewing gum, uh, and heat and see how they do. Many times the joint will recapture itself mm -hmm. and uh, meaning that it'll start to calm down, the muscles calm down. And the whole objective, uh, Bob, with TMJ treatment is to get rid of pain. That's really just like any other yeah. joint. We want the patient to be comfortable. Uh, more advanced cases, uh, we might do a splint or a little mouthpiece that we'll put in. And the purpose of the mouthpiece is to allow the patient to, to slide around on the mouthpiece, taking pressure off the joint. And therefore, you know, once the pressure is off the joint, the muscles relax, the ligaments relax, they're not firing. And so the patients, it's commonly referred to as a night guard. Mm -hmm. uh, more sophisticated treatment might be physical therapy in combination with a night guard. Uh, our team, you know, we work with some of the local physical therapists and, you know, how, having them involved with different things that they can do. We've had some great results with some of those, uh, you know, combination teams. And then even, you know, when it gets to be pretty severe, uh, we have to refer out for sometimes surgical intervention and just like a knee would do a, a you know, a, a joint replacement. So it's a serious deal that has got to be diagnosed properly. Yeah. TMJ. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Bob, you know, I brought a picture. I don't know if we have time, but I'd like to uh, put it up for a second. Um, sure. So, you know, this is, uh, I don't know if you recognize this, but <laughs> this is 1979. And uh, I believe you're probably a freshman. And uh, talking about TMJ, if you look at the upper upper corner, the upper, it'd be my <laughs> upper left, there, your defensive coach is there, and you're immediately to his left. And I, I know from memory you created a lot of TMJ problems for Coach Vitone. So. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I know you, you're very proud of your football career, and I just wanted to let the viewers know he actually played, and the coach there, he Gave him quite a few TMJ problems. <laughs> Ryan anyway. France, thank you. Pleasure, Bob. <laughs> and now, the Sunday Brunch Power Player of the Week on the Bob Cordaro Show. Well, now we're joined by our Power Brunch Player of the Week, Bobby Adcroft. He, uh, he's, he, I've known of him for a long time because I was in the radio business. And he's been a star, top radio sales guy for decades. Uh, we know the family from Krispy Kreme Donuts. And uh, I got to start working with him a couple of years ago. But before that, I knew of an amazing story and, and an incredible fight that he had. Uh, and we are joined by Bobby Adcroft today. Bobby, thank you for coming. Of course, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Tell us a little bit about you. I mean, you're from a big family. I'm, I'm one of nine. Yeah. Um, my dad had a Krispy Kreme and our family still does. He started it in 1957. Um, I remember the stools across from Haddon Craftsman near <laughs> Scranton Prep. I remember that row of stools 
yeah. going in there so many years ago. And and this is a North Carolina based company. It is. And your dad, who I loved, yeah, he he was one of the first franchises out of first franchises. Period. He was one of the franchisees. You're right. He started it in 1957. Yeah. Yeah. The founder of the company, whose name was Vernon Rudolph. Incredible. Yeah. So the 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 Krispy Kreme story is inextricably linked with the Adcroft family story because you did, everybody worked there. All of you you lived and breathed this, this amazing thing. All nine of us worked there from age 14 or slightly before. Yeah. Uh, into our adulthood. So um, if that's the one thing that my dad gave me, it was a, and my siblings, a great work ethic. Yeah. I mean, I recall uh, at a time when my wife and I were just married decades ago and she was saying, taking a sick day today. And I'd be like, what's a sick day? <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is. You work when you're sick. <laughs> um, so, Bobby, how do you get in? You, you know, you go to high school, you go to college. Yeah. Uh, how do you get into the radio business? Was that your first stop after college? That was, um, I was working at my dad's donut shop as a baker. Uh, my shift was the three o'clock in the afternoon to 11 o'clock at night. And I had a six day work week. Um, and I was a student at the University of Scranton. Mm. Uh, married. And we had a baby, my wife and I. So um, I wanted to get my shift changed. And my dad said, no, this is the only shift available to you. <laughs> he said, well, why don't you have your wife have her change her shift? And I said, well, dad, she pays more than you do. Her, her job pays more than you do. <laughs> That's how family businesses are. So um, he had a weird quote, but he said, as the twig will bend, the tree will grow. I'm like, what? And then he, and I said, dad, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, finally, uh, if you can find a better job, go ahead and do it. And I went out a few weeks later. I stopped at WSER, 1320 on the AM band. This is back Avenue. in I, yeah, I early ran, 80s. I owned that station at one time. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And did an interview and got a job selling radio ads back then. Started there. Yeah. And you eventually get to, you know, the KRZ WILK group yeah. where you are today. Yeah. Amazing. I'm happy I'm there, as you well know. Yeah. It's That's the amazing. place to be. Yeah. So... Four years ago, roughly speaking, mm -hmm. you start to feel in what, the summer maybe of, of 219? 218, I started 19. to feel, the summer of 218, I started to feel a little bit tired. My wife and I, Bernie, go out for a walk every day after work, and typically it's two or three miles. I started feeling tired at mile one. And my wife thought, hey, there's something wrong. So I went to a doctor. But you're an early riser. I, I get mean, up. So, I mean, I get to up me, a, that would get, yeah. exhaust me <laughs> <laughs> right. anyway. Well, working in the family donut business, you had to wake yeah. up early. So I wake up every day at four o'clock. Yeah. Okay. So, but nonetheless. I by, would call that night, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most people would. We need not quibble. <laughs> right. <laughs> I agree. So, uh, by five, six o'clock at night, I'm going out for a walk with my wife. And, and by my, during my one, I was fatigued and said, hey, I'm tired. I need to take a break, which was just not right. Yeah. So I went to a doctor. I had some blood work done. Uh, he sent me to an oncologist. And I'll never forget. Immediately. Yeah. The, the counts were that low. It was Dr. Grimm in Dunmore. And he looked at my blood levels. This is uh, the day before Thanksgiving 2018. He says, I don't know what you have. But your blood levels are so low, I don't know how you're standing. I'm like, what are you talking about, Doc? I could drop down and do 50 push-ups right now. I'm fine. I'm yeah. just a little tired. He goes, well, tomorrow's Thanksgiving, but next week we need to do a bone marrow biopsy. Something's wrong. So having heard that, I call my wife and say, hey, I'm going to take the rest of the day off. I'm, I'm sick. She goes, what do you mean? You're taking the rest of the day off? You're sick? You're fine. Bobby, did he use the word you've got cancer? Did he, he never, you? he did not okay, say Okay, so he said we've got to go further. We've got to go further. But now I'm in an oncology office yeah. and I see cancer patients there. I'm thinking, what is he talking about? That night I come home, I rest, go to sleep. The next morning I can't get out of bed. I'm in so much pain. Now we've all heard of that placebo effect, okay? You know, the white jacket tells you, yeah. hey, this is going to make you feel better. Well, Nocebo is the opposite of that, also a derivative of a Latin term to bring harm. 
His words had such a profound effect on my body, my physiology, that I literally made myself feel sick. Or maybe you were feeling the illness that you already had. Perhaps, the first time. Yeah. perhaps, perhaps. A uh, week later, I had a bone marrow biopsy. I came in and uh, Dr. Grimm said, I have bad news for you. You have myeloplastic syndrome, a form of leukemia. Um, without a successful bone marrow plans, transplant, you won't live. Got to get it done. Bobby, when so many people that I know and that you know even more so, because you're part of that community now, yeah. have been confronted with this news, mm. and it's got to be devastating. How, it how, did it, how did it hit you? And what has your experience with other cancer patients and survivors been when they tell you and relate their version of this discovery? Well, for myself, it, it hit myself, my family really hard. Yeah. You know, it's- You're how old at this time? I'm 58 years old. Um, and I felt pretty healthy. How many kids? Six kids. Six kids. Seven grandchildren at that time. We have nine now, but um, I was in a little bit of denial, a little bit of anger. Uh, but after less than a few days, I, I came to accept it and thought, you know what? I, I've had a great life. I've been blessed my whole life. I have nothing to complain about. Uh, some people get this uh, prognosis at a very young age. Yeah. And um, I accepted the fact that like, hey, you know, what? I may not be here in a few months. Uh, but my daughter, Cecilia, insisted on a second opinion. She got in touch with a friend, Nicola Strange at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they took me right in. Um, it was Dr. Stein at MSK, and uh, he did an interview with me. And all six of my children and my wife were with me during that time. And I remember as soon as he walked in the room, I stood up, shook his hand as hard as I could. I said, hey, Doc, how are you? He goes, how are you? You know, I'm like, I, I think they have a misdiagnosis in Scranton. I feel great. So he talked to me a little bit more and he said, um, Did you feel great? I felt good. Maybe at that moment. Yeah, I felt good. Right. I, I, I didn't feel great, but I felt good. But I felt like the power of the subconscious mind was so important at that time. Um, a week later, a week later, actually, a few weeks later, he did another bone marrow biopsy. And he calls me the day on Christmas Eve, right after, right before uh, my kids were walking in and my wife from Christmas Eve mass at Immaculate Conception. Now, I was too tired to go to mass. So they're walking through the door and Dr. Stein calls me from MSK and he says, Bob, Bob Adcroft. I said, yeah, I have bad news for you. Your cancer cells have doubled in the past few weeks um, without a successful bone marrow plans, transplant. You, you, you have less than a few months to live. We got to get you down here immediately. Tomorrow's Christmas, but can you get down here the day after? Start chemo immediately. So I didn't want to alarm my wife and kids of that news on Christmas Eve. I'm like, oh, thanks, Doc. Okay, we'll, we'll see you soon. They're like, hey, what do you say? And I tried to bluff. I was like, hey, great news. He's going to see me early. They knew. They you know what that is. That, yeah, that it was, it was bad news. Um, but I still felt inside like this isn't, this isn't the end. And I realized that, you know, if I portray myself as a victim and give in, I'm doomed. So I, I really was positive, prayerful, and I had so much support, Bob, from my, my wife, my kids, my family, my in-laws, friends. I remember that fundraiser. That was amazing. At the Radisson. Yeah, that was amazing. Was, I, I, pictures were sent to me yeah. when I was in prison for that. It was like a zoo. I mean, it was yeah. everybody was, I was there. And, and you can't say that often. I was at MSK at that time uh, getting chemotherapy and in a hospital bed where I really couldn't barely get out of bed. And uh, How long did this chemo series last? Well, that started right after Christmas and went into March. Um, 2019. It, 2019. And um, it lasted then that short period of time, frankly. And once they got all the cancer cells, they did another bone marrow biopsy and said, okay, you have, you're cancer free. Now we're going to do a transplant, a bone marrow transplant. Fortunately for me, I had three perfect matches, three siblings. My brother, Sean, was a perfect match. So the bone marrow transplant. That made up for not uh, having, having to fight for the bathtub, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> one bathroom. Having the big family. That's yes, right. Eleven people, <laughs> including one, my parents. One, one bathroom. bathroom. Yeah. How old did it? I, yeah. I, that's so funny. Separate subject, but wow. Sure is. How did that? But work that's right so now? funny because we yeah. we had one rule in that household: you can never lock the bathroom door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I had the transplant. It's it's melodramatic. You get an injection. You get an injection. Oh really? Yeah. You get a you know a bone marrow injection. And what happens then is within a few days, your body can reject that. If you do, it's, it's, you have a very short period of time left because you're, you're down to nothing. You're as weak as possibly can be. Are there anti-rejection drugs being utilized at the same time? Or it's, or it's hey, you're getting this. You're getting this. And if you reject it? Then we'll see what we can do to save yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, but it was a success. And I stayed at Sloan in New York City into the month of May of 2019. I remember getting home and wow, what a reception. Mm. <laughs> it, it, I could get teared up thinking of it because the love um, of all the people that are saying, hey, welcome home. But I was still pretty weak. I was uh, very frail and I didn't even realize it. I remember stopping at my family business, seeing my brother Dooley who hadn't seen me and he's, he was in awe. He's like, oh, Bob, are you okay? And you know, I, were, you, were you fully ambulatory after the I, after this long stint in the hospital? I was good. I, I could get around. I remember that June going to the beach with my family in Stone Arbor, New Jersey, as we always do. And uh, you know, I couldn't I couldn't walk the length of the beach from um, where you get out of your car. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to have someone holding my left and right arm, but my mind was good. I knew that I was on the journey to get better. I, I think that's so important to to believe with all your heart and soul that I'm, I'm getting better, I'm doing bad, I'm doing really good. One of the things I remember them saying at Sloan was, you know, what's your pain level on a scale of one to 10? And I would say, I don't have pain. I have discomfort. Mm -hmm. I feel a little bit uneasy, but right, let's not use that pain word. And, and I would, they, they didn't like that. You know, they said, we need to know, but it's like, you know, it's not gonna do me any good. What's my discomfort level? I feel more comfortable saying that. As you're going through this, and actually through your life, yeah, faith is a big deal. Very big. Family's big. Yes. Community, mm. quite obviously. Yes. Those three things Got combine. They you do inspire everybody else. They inspire you. You're exactly right. Yeah. Family, faith, community are the reason I'm here today. There's no doubt in my mind. I, I wouldn't be here, Bob. And, and you blog about different inspirational subjects and different thoughts and just what's on your mind uh, yeah. often and it can be seen on Facebook. And I, sure. I, that was one of the things that attracted me to say, I, I didn't even have the television show at the time, but as soon as I started, I said, I got to have, I, you know, we're, I see them every day, but it's a special story. Yeah. Uh, you've, you've overcome it, mm -hmm. but you've, you're now like trying to tell people, Spirit is everything here. The, the, it's, the positive, the can do, it's every, faith, it's family, everything. all these things are what I'm about and they can help everybody else even if they're not sick. You're right. I, and I do try to tell people that and that's why I blog. In fact, I even do a podcast called Be Real Now by Bob Adcroft. Uh, worth watching, I might add. Be Real with uh, Bob Adcroft. Yeah. yeah. So it really comes down to where we are in our mind, I believe. Um, when I talk to patients, other people who have gone through this or are going through it, I say, you know, we don't, we can't control what happens to us at times, but we certainly can decide how we react to it. And if you react in an upbeat, positive way, and you, you've got to have the proper diet, you've got to have the proper sleep, you've got to have, even if it's as minimal as going for a 20 minute walk every day, you've got to do some exercise. Yeah. You do these you're gonna start feeling better. Walk like you feel better. Change your physiology, literally. Have that belief that's so compelling within you that when someone looks at you and say, hey, wow, you look, you look good today, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. And then say it back, I'm fantastic. I feel great. You know, I love the words I am, and I always say to people, any word that proceeds I am is like God saying it through. I think back of the, of the Easter uh, time when you know, Moses is saying, 
who sent me here? Who am I going to say? Well, he said, the Israelites are going to be sent, right? That little scene. And he said, tell them I am is sending you. And he's like, what? I am? Who's that, right? Well, that's of God. Like, so when I say I am strong, I am healthy, I am happy, my subconscious mind doesn't know the difference from real or imagined. And all of a sudden, everything's going through my body and saying, what? He's saying he's doing great. Yeah. And I, I sit up a little straighter. I, I smile a little bit more and I feel better. So it really starts with your thought, whatever thought you have. When you have good thoughts and you follow up with positive words and positive actions, you're on the road. You're in the direction of healing. Yeah. And my mother's a melanoma survivor, but she's more of a, an older school where never complain, never explain. But she did it through positivity and being positive and just knowing she was going to get it done. That's awesome. But do you, do you get to talk and interact with people? I have. As they're finding out they're afflicted to, to inspire them, to tell them this yeah. road can be handled? Yes. And I find that the most important thing for me to do is uh, listen. You know, never minimize what they have to say. Listen intently. And in the course of their conversation of them sharing their experience, then I may ask them if they say something that I feel that they could connect to and say, did you say, let them repeat something that's a positive. Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically what it is. I think that most people need to know that people care that they're listening. I remember coming out of a business uh, just months ago and uh, someone saying, did you say you're Bob Ancroft? Are you Bob Ancroft? I'm like, yeah. You're on my prayer list still. Mm. And I didn't even know this individual. I mean, that Bob has such a profound effect for someone to say, Bob, I'm praying for you. You're still on my prayer list. There are a lot of people who get this diagnosis who don't have the family. Yeah. They may not even have the faith, mm. but they don't have the family in the community. What do we, what do we say to them? Well, the most important thing for them, I think, is to get a support group. So whether it's uh, people at work, um, a, a parish priest, whomever that may be, you need a su support group. You, you absolutely have to start there. The, probably the biggest thing for them, I say, is every single day you have a conversation with the most important person in the world, and that is you. What are you saying to yourself when you look in the mirror? Are you saying, I'm sick? Or are you saying, I'm good? So they have to start with those positive thoughts. They have to get a support group. It doesn't matter if, if it's a family member, a friend, a neighbor, reach out. Anybody who's in that situation, I, I would love them to reach out to me. There's nothing more gratifying for me than to help those because I really believe, Bob, the only way we get is by giving, give back, okay? And I've been given so much, I've been given a second chance. Fantastic. Uh, Bobby Adcroft, thank you very much. Great pleasure. My pleasure. Wow. Critical information from Dr. France and inspiration from Bobby Adcroft. Great stuff. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cadaro Show on TV.